be. And if you're, oh. Uh, and uh, if you're not here for Ross, you should say anyway, because it's a cool talk. Um, yeah, so I'm Ross Wolf. This is the Hunter Games. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can find the adversary in your network um, using EQL. Um, so about myself, um, Ross Wolf, RW Access on Twitter. Um, if you want to follow me, you know. I don't count or anything. Um, I'm a threat researcher at Endgame, so I do a lot of work with our events. So, like, when I say events, I mean, like, endpoint telemetry, um, process, file, network activity, that sort of thing. Um, so I try to take those events and say, how can we turn this into a detection? How can we um, create new frameworks for um, for detecting things? And so as part of that, I created the event query language, which we open sourced last year, um, and a lot of, like, this entire ecosystem around it. Um, and I have a background, like before end game, I was at MITRE. I did a lot of like red and blue teaming there, so I'm kind of coming from that mindset of um, if I'm red, just like that usual purple test of like if I'm the red teamer, what am I going to do to evade the blue team? That usual like, cat and mouse game of um, how can you actually find something? Uh, and oh, <laughs> what's this? An email? Bad wolf report? Are we compromised? Like never mind. We'll uh, we'll get back to this unless oh, there's an update. All right, so this whatever is happening right now, I should probably pause. Let's look into this report. What are we, okay. Bad wolf execution flow, um, tiny graphic, but I'll just give you the high level. Um, starting from like drive by download through like lateral movement, eventually gaining privileges, moving across. Uh, and there's some like disk decryption going on, or encryption, sorry, that would've been interesting. Um, but like if you get a report, I don't know if anyone's ever had like an email, like here's this new report, here's this latest threat actor. Um, do we have them in our network, can we find them? What do we, what do we even write? How do I search this? Um, so I kind of want to take that question and give you an answer to that. Um, how can you find that? Um, and that's like, I want to answer that. What's the now what? Okay, we have a report. Now what do we do about it? And how do we get ahead of the next one? Um, so overall, I kind of want to talk about like, how can we take all that adversary behavior in general um, and use the attack framework to organize it and organize and orient our approach to writing detections? Um, I also want to go through uh, event query language and give you just basics of how to write your own queries. Uh, and then uh, I want to follow like what, what a real threat actor does. Um, going along the way and saying like, okay, if their next step is this, how would we write a detection for that? Um, and then there's also the question of, well, what if I don't have a report? I have nothing to go off of. How can I find something either suspicious or find something um, that feels uh, wrong for your environment? Uh, and then finally, like one thing that as, um, this is like why we're all here is like we want to like contribute to the community. Um, how can we take all these new detections we're going to write? How can we share them with other people and express them in a way that's um, easily tractable? And what like what are we doing at Endgame to try to uh, give back? So starting with like threat-based detection, like what's our, what's our general approach and process? Um, so this is loosely based off of um, a paper from my past life at MITRE. Um, but in general, it's like, okay, how do you start with attack? Start with your understanding of the threat landscape. Um, and instead of just thinking like, all right, we have these IOCs, do we have this hash? It's like, well, that's great, but that's going to answer one question. And as soon as something changes, it's like, it's useless. So like, how can you zoom out just a little bit? Um, I want to go through like what the attacker does. Uh, and in your network, like maybe you don't have, um, you don't have like full event data. Maybe you don't have file events. Um, because maybe they're just too expensive to collect. So like understanding what makes sense for your environment um, and what data you have, what can you work with is really important because um, how can you write anything if you can't even, if you don't have the data, your queries will just never match anything. Um, and then the next part for writing, writing your own detection is thinking, my platform is um, maybe some sim uh, and what's its query language? What capabilities does it have? Like can it, um, can it do like aggregations or something? And if you can't do that, maybe you're not going to write detections based off of that. But understanding what those capabilities are, what logic you can express, um, how you can like join your data. Um, and then finally, one of the last things is like, well, yeah, okay, you took a report, you wrote a detection, it's like, does it actually do what it's supposed to do? And part of that process is, um, is, red teaming essentially, or having um, having these unit tests. So Atomic Red Team is a testing framework that Red Canary released um, from MITRE has called ERA. Endgame released uh, Red Team Automation, and there's there's a handful more that you can use, but the point is like you should be you should be testing the stuff that you have. Um, these, a lot of these things are essentially like a red team in a can, a small little script that does like one behavior. 
Um, so it's a bit out of context, but if you want to like say, okay, well, how do we get something that's real, um, not just like this one technique, um, but how do we detect, how do we detect someone that's like operating and using the specifics of my environment against me? So like human red teams are also very important. And it's also, um, it's also okay to be willing to say that when you write detections, they can be wrong. Uh, I have, we've had a lot of guesses be like, this will never fire in Windows. And then it does, and I just like ask myself why, and you see software doing the strangest things. Um, and a lot of the noise that I run into is like automated software, which means that it's on every endpoint. So if when you make like a, um, a mistake and you're trying to tune something, you're often doing like at scale like every time. Um, so being able to think that like, is this, is the entire hypothesis I had just wrong? Do I need to rethink that? And that's like, I think that's a good healthy process to do. Uh, and sometimes like if, uh, like, if you run like your searches on a schedule or something like that's like CPU cycles, you can also get back. So there's also very practical reasons to, uh, to retire things that aren't producing fruit. So, um, that's kind of the high level of like, how do we write detections? What, what's the mindset that I'm taking, um, as blue, but like as a red team, um, what was going through like my head as I'm trying to compromise a network? Cause it's often like the same, same goals that an adversary has, right? They want to like eventually find your crown jewels, like steal your files or like um, maybe it's like some ransomware thing or something, but ultimately there's some goal and it's there. It's on your environment. So the first thing is like, I need to get into your environment. So that's going to be like some spear phishing or uh, most of the time it's going to be spear phishing. Uh, and then it's like, okay, uh, I have code that landed, but is, uh, am I in the right place? And so there's the next step is like, as a red team, you're like, I'm on the right host, run a host name command. Um, and then if it's, if it's on the right place, actually having some code to persist. So like when the system reboots, once the user logs off, you're not just screwed and don't have to resend the email again or hope for someone to double click on something. Um, then from there, it's like, okay, you have code, it's running, it's persistent. Uh, now you want to actually take control over it because you actually need to do the part of your mission. That's, that's your mission. So, um, taking over, having like a network connection back, um, and then, from there, gaining credentials, privileges, moving around the network between hosts, ultimately like collecting and exfiltrating information. Or sometimes you actually like, uh, like in a Stuxnet case, like you have a very significant impact you want to make. And that's also like a good part of like attacks. Like what was the, maybe the objective wasn't steal data, but it was like to severely like make you ineffective at your mission. And so like all of these things is going through like the adversary's head. So one question is like, how can we write something like, each step of the way and create this layered approach to writing detections. Um, oh, right, I forgot one. And, uh, and all these things we're trying to do while trying to evade the products you have. Um, so even thinking about that, like what are the things you're gonna do to try to evade and how can I turn that against them? Be like, okay, you're trying to hide here. It's like, I'm gonna look there. Um, and all this is like looking at the attack framework. So all these steps were taken, MITRE organized them into attack. Essentially, like you've got columns, which are tactics. They're like the high level objectives that I was going through. Individual cells here are the techniques. So like what are the individual methods to achieve that goal? And there's like so many threat reports in here. Um, and every technique has like what the technique looks like, how you could detect it, how you could mitigate it, what data is useful and some real world examples of it. But there's not like, here's a query, run this. Um, so I want to kind of get from, how do you go from here into under all this knowledge into something that's like operational? Um, and the next thing is like, okay, you know what the threat looks like. You got to do their mindset. Like what's my data? Um, in this exam, in this slide, I'm going to use Sysmon. It's like free open source, pretty easy to use. Um, and their data set's pretty rich. You often have to tune it down because there's so much data. Uh, and one example of an event is like, it looks like, uh, this at the bottom, um, command line process names, um, users, PIDs, PPIDs. So you can even like rebuild the process tree with it. So there's ends up being a lot here. Um, so that's kind of like one example of data, and this is, might look different for you. Or maybe you don't even have endpoint data and you're looking at network telemetry, but understanding that um, is also very useful. Um, so we have the data. Um, this maybe you don't have equal, um, but what, what your query capabilities are, just pretend that this is those. Or just read all these as pseudocode, that works too. Um, so we wrote it, we tried to be concise, try to be simple when writing it, um, it's not tied to any particular schema. So even though like we use the end game, um, we don't, it doesn't only work there. Um, and I'll get into more some like a demo of using it. Um, 
and it's also oriented around like a real time approach. So even though you could use it for searching, you could also take this and like run data through this pipe and get things that are matching as it happens. Um, another thing about this is I know that a lot of these behaviors that you're trying to detect are like, you see a process that drops a file that then executes and makes a network connection. Like that's kind of complicated and, and saying like, give me just network connections that look like blank. Like you can't really anticipate that. Um, so it was really important to make sure that we could support things that span multiple events, find an easy way to connect them without having to deal with the SQL inner, outer join. I honestly never remember, um, so I try to avoid that exact problem. Uh, and then instead of like having like crazy syntax, like contain starts with everything, um, we just have like a function notation. That's just our design choice. Um, so at the very basic level, we're looking at like comparing fields to strings, wildcards. Query might look like this in equal. It's like the simplest form, you'll probably see one. Um, so this is just looking at process events. So uh, let me see, I think I got a laser I can do too. Um, so looking at like process names, so this is a field in our schema that matches SVC host. And either the command line argument doesn't have dash K, which SVC host always should, or it comes from, or it doesn't come from services. So this is just one thing, like find weird SVC hosts, boom, here's like an uh, easy free one to go. Um, so this is like at the start of like, this is what like a simple equal query would look like. But we can also do sequences, so maybe have multiple events in a row. Um, how would you write that? And so the thought is you can say sequence with a max span of five minutes. So within these brackets here, you have a standalone query, like from the last slide. So this file where file name is star.exe, well, that's the first event. Grab the user and file path, and then match that to a process event, but the file path now like, became the process path. So that might be kind of confusing to say like out loud. Um, but essentially these fields that you're joining on have to match all the way across. And it's not like some crazy complicated SQL join, it's always like exact matching. Um, there's also uh, unordered sequences or joins. So like tell me if these two things happened. So I could say like, was there a file to this location? Was there a registry modification to this path? If there was both, you get a match. If there was only one, you wouldn't. You could also, again, like add this by for um, saying, are there three incoming network connections to these three ports between these two hosts? So that's another thing you could do with join. Um, another thing with equal is like, yeah, it's nice to describe something you know what you're looking for, but if you have a lot of data sifting through it, um, I want to make that easy as well. So we have pipes. Um, it's like Unix-like, or if you know Splunk, this should translate pretty, pretty easily. So looking at, like, here's one, like, looking at process events and then um, removing duplicate, like, command lines. And then from there, if you count how many things there are per process, you know how many unique command lines there were for a process. So the thought would be here is, like, could you figure out things that are, um, have command lines that are very predictable? And if they have less than, like, five command lines normally, maybe you could watch for deviations. But this is just, like, one example of something you could do with a couple pipes. Uh, another cool thing, uh, one of my favorites, is that we can track process lineage. So if your events have PID and PPID, well, we can just chain those together, looking at creations and deletions or terminations. Um, so we could write a thing that's like, look for network from PowerShell processes, but not ones that came from explorer.exe. Um, and so we could watch the whole chain and be like, okay, uh, then this checks back, this does or doesn't track back to explorer. Um, and then we could use like event of and child of as well. If you just want to do like little smaller um, ways, like you could do child of, child of, child of, child of, you can nest them as much as you want. If you want to validate like an entire tree checks out. So that's like just of what equal looks like. Um, but let's actually turn this into code, something we can actually act on and take those bad wolf reports and make it useful. So um, how do we detect behaviors that we already know exist? Um, we already talked about how to, what the adversary does, what their mindset is, uh, mindset is, and a little bit of attack of what specific techniques are, but we're going to go, let's go through some more, some more specific techniques and say, how would I write a detection for this? So, um, first technique is that initial access, your spear phishing email. How would you detect spear phishing email? One thought is, a lot of the time you're going to see malicious macros, and those are going to run like in the context of an office product, and then those macros often, um, will run PowerShell or some scripting host or run a, like a batch file or something. So we can just look for a parent process relationship. Did a PowerShell come from Word? And something as simple as like that actually does really well. Um, not, there's not many legitimate use cases for having Office like VBA running PowerShell. And if there are, talk to me after because I'm really curious what you're trying to do. 
Um, another option would be like, maybe you don't have PowerShell running, um, but it's a script that drops a file and runs it. So you could say, okay, within like a five minute span, look for exe files dropped by Word, Excel, or PowerPoint. Like this could also be like an attachment. Um, but hopefully you have filters set up so your exe files are not um, directly in the middle of emails. Um, so looking at like Word creating them and then them running within like five minutes, like well, why? Um, and a lot of times it's trying to break out of VBA. So that's one thing you could do. Um, another step is like, okay, access has gained. Um, now privileges need to be um, need to be gained, like it's escalating a system uh, and persisting so that way you're not um, kicked off with the reboot. So one thought here is, and this actually happens, um, so that bad bad wolf report was actually just bad rabbit, but renamed. Uh, so bad rabbit, one thing they did was actually take scheduled tasks, run them as system, but the user that's creating the task wasn't system. So like this is really weird to me because I have to ask like, why would why would any normal user, even an admin, it's also weird. Why do they need to run code as system? Why is administrator not enough? So looking at looking at like that deviance um, here, like the user wasn't system. The command line contains um, system there. That's one way to detect, detect privesque with scheduled tasks. Uh, another attack technique where things get hairy uh, is like command and control. So th as far as they go in an attack, it's just saying like it's almost like they took all the network connections and just um, pulled out the metadata of it, like was the port common or not? Is the protocol common or not? And it's the combinations that make that interesting. But if you just want to say like, I'm looking for uncommon ports in my network, you're going to have a long query. Like I didn't even make it to like 443, so there's not even SSL in here. Um, so this could go on for a long list, and even then you're going to run into false positives. Like between hosts, RPC will end up creating like dynamic like high ports. Or, um, or maybe there's some new protocol that something else has. And you're just going to run into like alerts and alerts and alerts and more alerts. And you're going to have a really bad time if you try to do that. So a different approach that, that we try to say is like, well, instead of thinking like what's weird about the connection is maybe what's weird about where this network connection is coming from. Uh, so what processes are really weird to be making network connections? So there's um, lull bins or it's one, of those, one of those words you like never say out loud, you read it, but I don't know. Uh, or lullbuzz, the living off the land binaries and scripts. It's like tools that are built into Windows that you don't normally use, but they allow you to gain code execution by like dropping like some interesting, uh, like what is it, the XSL file for like MSXSL, which is, oh, I have my pointer on. Um, yeah, so uh, that's one. So looking at these programs and saying like, should these be making network connections? Um, and then the cool thing about turning this into like an equal sequence is now you have the process creation event tied to the network event. And so you can look at the command line and the destination address at the same time. It's like, oh, that's interesting. This was outbound and it has some weird, uh, weird like dot ru in the command line. It's like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, another tactic moving on down um, through their life cycle, like blending in. So where was the file actually placed? One thing that uh, you'll see, and it's, I think it still happens, um, is thinking of programs that look just like normal Windows processes. So there's like core Windows programs that are running. If you look at Task Manager, it's never empty, right? There's all those built-in things. But they always run out of the same place. They're always signed by Microsoft. Um, so their names are common targets. like Or LSAS, the common one is like what, one SAS or LSAS with two S's. So there, another thing you could look for is like mismatches. Um, but look at these in the wrong place. So there's one example I'll show later um, with is like C Windows System 32 slash INF slash LSAS. Um, so even getting this part of the query where you're looking at it's in System 32 but not in a subdirectory um, is one way to anchor this and to weed out like and to get it like just precise enough so you don't accidentally whitelist the whole directory recursively. Another approach for um, finding things that are kind of weird, maybe you've got some injection detection but maybe you don't. If you don't, one way to try to infer it is think of programs that were um, like looking for like process howling, like it starts a child, then it puts code in it, is looking for programs that ran from the wrong parent. So like the built in when Windows boots up, it runs things like in an order and that's it. That's the only time LSAS runs. So if you have like two LSASs in your task manager, you should check. You might have accidentally downloaded some Stuxnet malware um, or whatever else. Uh, so looking for process creations, looking for extra versions of those running with, from the wrong parrot is one approach for looking for, um, looking for like masquerading and process um, injection. 
Another, another command, you could go like the Mimi Cats approach and try to find accesses to LSAS. Or you could say, um, was anyone like grepping through for passwords? I know, it's, it's this one's like, why is this query taking up such a small part of the screen? Because it actually has worked for us. I don't know why, but Red Team's actually running through here. Like you should be doing your grepping like client side. But uh, we've actually seen like Red Team's from this one as well. Uh, it's just... So I thought I thought when this was created it was a joke, but it's worked. Uh, another one looking for discovery, so like recon commands. Uh, that ends up being kind of tricky because there's so many different ways you could do it. You could say like five in, a, in two seconds or something else, but I just created a couple buckets of commands and said, was there something from each bucket? Because um, you might see ten different IP commands in a row, IP config commands, which I've done. Uh, but how often do I do IP config and look at processes and look at what users are installed? Not very in the sort window. That's suspicious. So that's one approach. Looking for lateral movements, like you could look for remote PowerShell. Looking uh, when over WinRM, so seeing an incoming network connection followed by the PowerShell provider host. Um, and then since you've got both of those, nice thing is you, you know where it came from. You've got the incoming source address and you have like the user that the process ran as. So you know who's running remote PowerShell as well. Another one's looking for XFIL. A lot of actors will bring WinRAR themselves. Um, I don't, my guess is that it's not open source and they can't compile it in, so they just bring the signed version and just drop it on, run like the HP flag for encrypting, uh, and then it creates a RAR file and they grab it back. Um, so looking for that, this one is a little bit cheating because it is oriented around a specific tool, um, but collection is hard, kind of hard otherwise because otherwise you're looking at like every file read event and that's, that's tough. And the last one, for the um, is like impact. So what what ways was the environment negatively impacted? Um, one command for cleaning up tracks is deleting volume shadow copies via like a couple of built-in Windows processes or clearing Windows event logs. Uh, and here's just some uh, some commands you could use and how you could search for them. So that's all that's all nice, but all of those I knew what I was looking for. So um, what about when we don't know what we're looking for? What what are some general approaches we can have to hunt? And this is where it goes from like how do you how do you detect for known things versus how do you hunt for this known unknown? So one way I kind of think about it is like, all right, I don't have a threat report yet. I don't know who the actor is. I don't know what they did. I don't know why they're here, but maybe they are. So someday someone's going to write about this. So eventually you'll see a report that looks like that. But today the info you know is very little. Um, and so you're like, well, I'm out of luck. It's like, can, can anyone help me out? And uh, that's kind of how that feels. It's like, nice, later. Um, but I'm not going to do that to you. I'll give you some approaches for what threat hunting is. And to make the talk a little less dry, uh, I've got some memes sprinkled throughout. Um, so how do, we, uh, how do we proactively look for an adversary? It's like, well, we know how they think. Let's use that against them. Um, we, we, without looking for particular techniques, think of like what evidence does a tradecraft leave? And specifically, what makes that weird in my environment? So what things are happening, it's so like prevalence, by that I mean what things are happening on just a few endpoints out of a lot? What things are just happened within the past couple of days? Or like what patterns do you see? Like every night at 9 p.m. there's a network connection going here. What's that about? Um, so those are just some general approaches for like st sifting through your data for threat hunting. Uh, so one question you could ask is, uh, what parent-child processes uh, have like, what, what parent-child process relationships are new or rare in my environment? So you could look at process creations. Um, this is kind of like the other one where I had that long hard-coded query, but you could say, look for a lot of these and find what's rare and then sort those. Oh yeah, sorry, there's the unique count pipe. So this is gonna take all the uniques, remove the duplicates, but add a field back saying how many duplicates there were. Um, so of those, now you have the 100 most recent processes that were seen for the first time. Of those, like, take the top 10 rarest ones. So there's just a way of getting that rare and recent question, which are kind of hard to mix. So I've got some data in here, too. Um, one of these, there's uh, some benign activity that you'll find. The first one is, like, a random parent process name, and then the one at the end is also, like, a random, um, random child process name, I think. Um, so those will always be noisy because they were the because the names are random but there's still things that show up in here uh and let me get the pointer back quick and one thing is looking for like what are new uh 
parents and children of PowerShell. Like there's PowerShell running this running run DLL32 with the dot dat file with a random name and then some um, entry point that we don't know. So that, that actually brings up an interesting point is like maybe we could target this a little bit better and say what our new parent and ch child processes of PowerShell. And now you get all of a sudden all that noise kind of went away and you got this thing that sticks out because this PowerShell had never spawned this before. Another question you could ask is, uh, what, uh, yeah, I'm in. Uh, what recently first seen processes have made network connections? So you saw the process, you've never seen it before, and it made a network connection. Uh, a question I would usually want to ask is why? And a lot of the time you'll find like installers that are like two stage. It's just a tiny little download file. It's like, oh cool, it's only like 500 makes, and then it, or <laughs> that'd be a lot, uh, like 500 uh, kilobytes, and they're like, oh, it's got to download like 50 megs. It's like, okay, that explains the network connection. So you'll see like, if you try this hunt in your environment, you'll probably see like setup files that might like reach back, like here's some that we that I've seen. Um, but also you can find these living off the land binaries from earlier. Um, like install util. Maybe it normally, um, it never ran before, and the first time it did, it made a network connection. There's another thing there, like that install util one, is you could look for things that have have run before in your environment, but every time they have, they never made a network connection, but they did now. So why? Why the change? Why the sudden change in behavior? Uh, so one question you could ask is like, okay, what, what have I seen before like this date, but the first time it made a network connection was after another date? That's kind of what's going on in this query. Um, why, is, uh, why is Hide the Pain Herald suddenly on the phone? Uh, so uh, another one is looking for... Uh, uh, privilege escalation, so files that were dropped by a non-system user, but they somehow made their way up to system in the short time. So how did they escalate that quickly? That's a good question that I would want to have answered. But there's there's still some noise in there. There's some times where, um, like, you'll run a program and it escalates itself. I don't know why that's always necessary, but sometimes software does that. Like Zoom is one example I've seen. Um, but then this, this INF SVC host one from earlier up top is... Uh, some example of legitimate, that's probably small, legitimate activity, or not legitimate, sorry. Um, that would also be very suspicious to look at that. Because now you're looking at two different things that it would have triggered. Another one to think of is uh, looking for recon commands. So we had the whole approach of looking for things in buckets and trying to do some fancy foo. But one thought is uh, what programs are being, are making outgoing network connections and then asking for information about the system. That's kind of a weird combo. What's going on there? Um, and you might find some noise in here. Maybe you'll find some admins doing something. Uh, that's generally the trend of noise. Uh, but that's one, one more thing you could look for. Another one is looking for uh, brute force activity. So seeing a lot of log on, incoming log on failures. So this is looking at Windows event log. So switching from like processes, files, networks to looking at Windows log activity. So that Windows has like 4624 for logon events, that's the event ID, and 4625 for failures. So the thought for this one is, what if you see five failures before you see a success? And you eventually do see a success. Um, and the until part of the sequence is saying, if I do see a success before I see four or five, um, just ignore it. Um, reset the counter for that, for that IP. Um, and so this would find cases, the cool thing about this is this wouldn't just find people brute forcing a single user, but doing like a password spray. It's like, okay, I got a bunch of crash passwords. I don't know what works on this host. So I'm just going to throw them all at it. Some of them are fail, some of them won't. But if they like fail too many times before they get a success, now like now they tip their hand to you. Uh, and one last one is, uh, oh, never mind. I have more than one more. Um, looking for WMI. So WMI is kind of an interesting beast. Um, incoming WMI um, process events. So like the WMI lets you remotely spawn and manage other hosts. So uh, one thing for this is if you have an incoming, if you have a process that was created by a network connection, WMI will give it a brand new token be like, all right, here you go. You're coming for a remote thing. You don't exist on this use, on this host. Here's a new token that ties with your logon session. Here you go, and we'll run the process. Um, but one thing that's cool about this equal approach is when you do a unique, you always get the first thing um, that matches. So for every token, what's the first process it did? And then you can check. You can say, was the first process that used this token WMI or a child of WMI? And if it was, um, then you know it was created remotely. 
or created by another user locally. Both of those are weird cases. Uh, and here's some example of noise that I've seen before. Um, some Nessus that I'm guessing has like already logons, login information to testing whatever. And, um, and then also uh, some Lazarus group, actual like what that looked like with the IP changed. Um, that was basically like right out of the report. And the last one is looking for a suspicious lateral movement between hosts. So this won't work on a workstation, or on a server, sorry. You run this on a server, you're just going to blow up everywhere. You'll find what all your endpoints are in your environment fast. Um, so the thought is, what about incoming to a workstation or maybe a s different type of server? So on, on a host, looking at what, um, looking at incoming SMB and RPC, sometimes you'll see incoming SMB, like connecting to Windows file shares, dropping a file, um, and then using RPC to execute it or to do something else. So you kind of have the like the copy and the execute sometimes you can find with this. So um, that's kind of some techniques I've got for hunting with uh, hunting for things you know, hunting for things you don't. Um, so what can, great, now how do I actually use any of this? So we've, since we've open sourced equal, you can just install it. It's a Python package. You can just pip install equal. There's a CLI. You can run equal query. Um, but that's fun. Let's actually like do something. So I've got, uh, <laughs> as of this morning, a demo. Um, how do I? All right, cool. So let me switch over to this quick. Right on. All right. So we've got this equal shell that we've got uh, CLI that we use. So there's no like UI here. Uh, with some fun tab complete. Uh, <laughs> too much time spent on the tab complete. Uh, so I could load this data file. So like let's load. We since we at Endgame have released like several data sets. Here's some you can use. Um, so we've got this data set here, normalized RTA. There's 31,000 events. So we looked at them. The cool thing is, since I looked at all those events just then, um, I figured out what the schema is. So like network events have the have process PIDs, and those PIDs are numbers. Um, or yeah, network and file and process. Um, and looking at different them and figure out like what you can do. So now um, you could actually perform a search and I could search for um, like maybe I just want a count of all of all the different event types like how many process events how many network events how many file events it's like okay that's kind of cool you get some JSON results you can see that most of the data is actually registry so maybe that needs some tuning uh, so you could then like render this as a table it's like okay that's a little easier to read uh, another thing you could do is looking for uh, has anyone heard of squibbly do so there's this technique called squibbly do that um, I think it's a Casey Smith thing. And one thing for one thing this one did is it was like register reg server 32. Um, so I'm going to try to type and talk and see how this goes. Uh, but it's a process event coming from reg server 32. And it's a, since it's a creation, I want to get process creations. Uh, the next thing is like, okay, we, with the squibbly two tech, a, uh, attack, um, it would also load this DLL. So I could look for that image load where the image name equals um, scrubs.dll. And then finally, so that it executed, it loaded this DLL, and then it made a network connection. And I don't really care where it went, so I'll just say, like, where true. Cool, you can still see that. Um, and that's, that's it for that query. So we got three results. Um, oh, my table messed them up. Um, so if we saw a table, we could actually say, okay, well, here's the process event. It ran as Alice. The parent was Python. <laughs> this was RTA running. And then um, it loaded the DLL and made the network connection. So you can play around with your data, ask all kinds of questions in here to make it a little bit more tangible was kind of one, one hope of all this. Um, so that's a bit of like what you can do with equal, what it actually feels like. Uh, we also have this analytics library that we've posted. Um, it's called like the equal, equal lib. And we've gone through like attack so far. If we've created 45 or so, um, analytics and red canaries contributed a handful as well. There are, uh, there's also some data sets. If you just want to play around and ask those hunting questions, just like I did. Um, if, yeah, we've got several data sets you can use. It looks kind of like this. We've got attack essentially annotated with all of our detections. So if you're trying to 
orient your approach around, approach around MITRE's attack. Um, we've got a way to like kind of build your coverage out. Uh, and you have, if you have a different data set, there's also ways that you can take a query that we wrote in equal against that schema and convert it. So you could, you could take a query looking for like MSHTA with a certain command line, is this one here. Um, but we can actually convert it to map to your data. So as long as you say how to, how to go from one to the other, and there's mappings in there for Sysmon and for uh, one or two other ones, um, we can even, even convert things where like maybe you don't have a process name, but you have the full path, then we know the name is part of the path. And so like that's something that we did here. Um, so yeah, so uh, over the next couple weeks, we hope to update equal as well, get that, um, that CLI that I demoed, um, probably over the next uh, day, or so, day or so get that public, uh, adding a Python API that we have. So if you have other projects in Python, you want to just you say, okay, the CLI doesn't really work for me, but I do have a real time stream of events that I want to like build my own, maybe have some intrusion detection system you're trying to write or something. Uh, it's all streamable, so you can stream data through and get it straight out. Um, and then we're also working on like 75, maybe 100 more analytics map to attack if you're trying to like increase your coverage and get more that we plan on sharing. Uh, and if you want to follow Equal, you can, um, we're on Twitter and Gitter, uh, which is uh, like a chat, us uh, kind of Slack-like. Um, cool thing about it, though, is that you can use your existing like GitHub or Twitter account. So if you have one, you're, you can even lurk, so you don't even have to let us know that you're there. You can just watch, even though there's only like two comments in there so far, and they're both me. Uh, there's also like an email if you're like super old school and do that thing with Equal, um, equal at endgame.com. And if you want any like resources, we've got several blog posts. Um, this is all on read the docs, so there's docs to read. Um, and there's Git repos you can clone. Uh, there's also a, a guide. Where's, where's Paul? Oh, there you are. Yeah, Paul and uh, Devin from Endgame wrote on uh, just a general guide to threat hunting. It's not equal base at all, but just some of these same general techniques, like how do you find weird registry rights? Um, we have like there's an ebook on there you can download. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's it for me. Do I have uh, any questions? Sure. <laughs> there it is. Is there plans to, uh, I just said with the, the attendant announcement that Elastic's in the process of hopefully acquiring Endgame. Is there plans to like integrate some of this stuff into like the Kibana front end for Elastic databases and leverage this against their schema or? Great question. Uh, I can say basically nothing, but there's a great blog post that you can read that's corporate and official on, uh, I think, the Elastic and the Endgame side. Uh, so if you do want to follow more, basically that. Other than that, I, I can't really have anything I can share. Uh, any other questions? All right. Great. Thank you.